So it looks like I am. It appears as though I'm live now. It wasn't coming through. So just give me a sec. And I'm organizing just the last couple things. And let me make sure I have. So I believe I am on. Yeah, sometimes I get uh, false readings from things. It just wasn't coming through on mine. If you're not getting me, please let me know. As I'm setting up my monitor now. Yeah, it just wasn't coming through that it was reading me. So... Okay, so it appears as though it's reading me now, and I am on. Good. Okay, so it is recording. It's all gone. And I left up this chart for you because I know everyone loves this chart. And let me move my mug out of the way. As you can see, it is an incredible chart. I'll kind of move myself around here. It, it shows... How easy it was to organize this for the war. Now I'm just I'm still trying to figure out, figure out what the use for this would be. It seems to have no use at all. So uh, a couple things then I will. So same deal as before. Uh, take pictures of the notes or whatever at the end of the week. I'll put that assignment up today or tomorrow. I did give you a reading assignment that we do at the end of the week. A quick little quiz on that. I did also give a uh, a document thing. And the documents, I just want you to do uh, for two of the documents of the second DBQ, I think it's on page 522. It, I'm close. But the end of that unit, the second DBQ about the reason for World War II, and I don't particularly like the question, but just think about how you would answer the question. Don't worry about a thesis for that one. And then write down or pick two of the documents. And for two of them, write a sentence showing how you would use that document to reinforce your argument relating what your view no quotes remember you do not quote documents any yahoo can quote do not quote in your own words explain how that document would reinforce your argument relating it to a particular fact that you know and then for one of those documents include hap and that is why there is a certain bias in that document either the author or the political cartoon whatever it might be and basically explaining why blank believes this because of this. They believe it because of historical events going on at that time or their point of view, what about them or the, the people they represent or who they're trying to influence, the, the purpose. So that's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna give you a reading on the atomic bomb. I am just getting a copy of it online now. So hopefully tomorrow I'll be able to get it to you. And then on uh, to get my days right. Friday, I think my plan is for Friday, I will put the DBQ out that you're going to have. I will have to change the directions because the DBQ is for a normal, for the old style of DBQ where you had to use six documents. For, the, for this one's only four, but I'm going to leave all the documents in there because it's going to be hard to make another copy. You just have to pick four of them instead of uh, six. And so that will be due soon. And a couple more little bits of announcements. We had a... Uh, there's rumblings that the um, they might begin to start to reopen the economy and potentially schools down the road. I don't know when that will be. The school shutdown, the stay-at-home order for schools ends this week, and there's a rumor that we might get started, but that's only phase one, and schools aren't supposed to start for a while after that. And so my guess is I can't imagine for a couple weeks, at best case scenario, you never know. Um, because we have so shut down, the number of cases in Montana has been pretty low, but it travels really fast and we frankly just don't know about it. It's amazing how little we know. So we'll have to see. We will cross that bridge when we get here. We kind of have a pattern now going and you know we'll just change, we'll go to school. But as I understand it, 
even if schools start picking up again in Montana and a few other places in two or three weeks, which there's a chance, I don't know. <laughs> I really don't know. But the College Board is committed to the test they're going to give. You at home, uh, 45 minutes, uh, one DBQ, and that appears to be the world we're in for the test. All right, so let's get back to this because it's also a history class. So we got through mobilization. I went through the turning point battle of Midway where the U.S. sunk four carriers and uh, Coral Sea, how Japanese expansion after Pearl Harbor and what happened after Pearl Harbor. So let's get to this mobilization. I believe we got through the building up of the massive army. And one thing I should add, it might seem like that number of troops is a lot, but the army only had, only had 2.75 million men as actual combat or ground soldiers. And most of those men weren't even in combat. Most of the men were in supply. My face is covering this up. So let's move it down to here. Most of those men were supply or behind the lines. And there was always a shortage of troops, troops, a massive shortage of troops. No country ever had a surplus of soldiers, combat soldiers ready to fight. And what the U.S. planned they would need soldiers for in 1944 turned out to be totally inadequate across much, much of Europe. And they would have to move soldiers around. It was a real crisis for the entire war. And we talked a little bit about George Marshall. There's Marshall. Where is my mouse? Right there. Okay, so let's get to the boards. The War Production Board would be created in 1942. And this was significantly better than what happened in World War II. Remember World War or World War One. In World War One, the US didn't start producing large numbers of armaments until 1919. The war was over. Here it worked much faster, and this would Force, literally lay out for companies to retool. And here's a little bit of propaganda. You show your muscle, more productivity. Now, some companies resist it. There is a famous story where the head of General Motors literally had to be arrested and carried out by MPs because he didn't want to totally retool and eventually become part of the process. That's a, a long story. But a lot of companies were making a significant amount of money by 1942 doing what they were doing, and they wanted to keep making money. And that's why I put their money over country. Profits were more important. It was, it's always shocking to me how many people, how many companies continue to trade um, mostly indirectly, but knowing that they're trading with access powers. Ford, Standard Oil, DuPont, other companies like that were still trading through Spain, and they, they knew that those products through neutral Spain were getting to Germany and Italy. And Ford and GM had factories in in Germany that were so were technically taken over by the German government but in fact after the war they would demand money for the factories destroyed by allied bombings and actions in World War II and get it but anyways back to this a couple things first off by 1944 the US alone was producing twice as twice the number of goods as all the Axis powers added up and you combine that with the massive numbers of Soviet equipment, it was unbelievable. Britain also armed greatly, but this is somewhat misleading. Japan was still this kind of mix of medieval and modern, and Germany, remember what I told you, they never fully mobilized till 1942. So Germany never reached peak production till 44. But a couple things, unemployment ended. Here's the unemployment rate at the height of the Great Depression, which as, I am, I just gotta say, we are getting close to those numbers right now. I just, it, it's unbelievable. Uh, maybe we'll have to spend time talking about the pandemic. I mean, this is gonna be a world changing thing. You know, I've gone through a few things. You know, I've been around a long time. So I remember you know, the Civil War and World War II and the Great Depression. And, but, you know, the Cold War ending or 9-11, um, things like that in my life or the, um, you've had, in your life, the Great Recession. But the big thing is this pandemic is really going to be a changing moment in your life. One of those hinge moments. But look at unemployment. So here's the New Deal, unemployment going down, Roosevelt recession, and then unemployment was basically zero by 1944. Basically zero. And look at the munitions output, just skyrocketing for World War II. And then ending you can see after the war, things changed dramatically. But 
production went up dramatically and I should add, you'll see it right there, that map that's on the right, that is debt. The government borrowed money like mad and the total public debt was exceedingly high. Look how much the um, debt exploded during the war, but the GDP grew too. And you also notice the massive increase for the New Deal, massive increase for World War II, and very high economics or high economic growth all through the 60s and 70s. We have been much lower on average. The economy of the 1960s and 70s was sky high compared to today. And look at how many, this is the production of aircraft, ships, other equipment, just a massive increase in armament production. The U.S. won not only because of, well, let's be clear, because of the Soviets, but also because of the bravery of the soldiers and uh, you know, hard fighting both in the Pacific and Europe, but production, including, I had to put this down, one of the great inventions, the Jeep. But one of the big examples were Liberty ships. Henry Kaiser Shipping Yards would take the ideas of mass production in the assembly line and make merchant vessels, freighter ships. And the numbers of ships, these are thousands and tons of ships being constructed in the U.S., and these are the sinkings by U-boat. Just overwhelmed them. These fast, prefabricated, fa quickly built, prefabricated ships, they built them by the hundreds in a, a year. And, you know, they were simple, basic designs. These were war winners. Heck, they would take these ships and put a flat top on them and turn them into a small little aircraft carrier to escort ships. These were remarkable inventions and a classic example of American production, which seems like a different world than today as we, we get almost everything from overseas. And here's another example, the number of tanks. The U.S. produced a huge amount of tanks. Even though U.S. tanks were not comparable to German or Soviet tanks, these number of tanks would overwhelm the enemy. Soviets made a lot of tanks. You'll notice German tank production was relatively low until 44. The British, they committed, okay, they just basically used American tanks. They committed to making bombers, but that's another story. And getting to the workers. So mass numbers of workers here. We'll talk a little bit more about um, types of workers coming in that fits in a different place. But the War Labor Board was created much like in World War I, and that was to try to limit strikes and to try to control wages and was much more pro-union and pro-worker, very pro-union organization for the most part, even though John L. Lewis, and that's supposed to be, an, uh, that's a, I didn't capitalize the L, sorry about that. But John L. Lewis of the Steelworkers Union, who would start the CIO, remember him from the Great Depression, he would, he would lead a couple strikes in the coal mining industry because wages were not keeping up with inflation. And, but for the most part, there weren't that many strikes. This is a tough one because a lot of people call them unpatriotic. But when he made it very clear, we have workers literally risking their life, working 12 hour days to fuel the economy to win the war. They are two patriots. And so Lewis did um, lead a few strikes, but wages were mostly controlled they, to control inflation. But one thing that happens, as unemployment dropped, as companies are hiring workers like mad, the way that companies deal with low unemployment and competing for works is raising, competing for workers is raising wages. Well, they couldn't raise wages because the government controlled that. And so through labor unions, they added benefits. And most of the benefits where you think about today that a lot of employers have, let, let me rephrase that. Workers in my age had this view of benefits that, that we would get for working and almost all those came from unions. And this was started in World War II, workers of my generation. Workers of a modern generation are not getting the same benefits. And we are noticing that right now when you have over 25 million people asking for unemployment insurance, because it's gonna be well over that. It could be 30 million people who have been laid off and asking for unemployment insurance by the end of this week. And they don't have the benefits today that they did then. And it's very noticeable today. But some of the weird things that happen in our economy, that's unlike any place else would happen here. And one of the biggies is healthcare. Healthcare became a benefit that companies could give 
besides wages. And now we have this weird convoluted system that healthcare is tied to employment. And that's a World War II way to get around the fact that wages were controlled. And in the 1950s, that became by tax law, the way that most workers get their healthcare. Most people under the age of 65, they get it by terms of employment. And the problem with that is what happens if companies shut their doors and workers don't have healthcare? This was a crisis in 2008, 2009. Now it is one of those catastrophes that is literally just starting to happen, especially when the people who have lost their jobs because of something called a pandemic, which by definition is a healthcare crisis. But yeah, we don't have that. Every other country has some kind of guarantee for health healthcare that's outside of work. Even countries like Germany, that they do it through employment, through very publicly controlled, government controlled healthcare insurance, they have a system set of you still keep your insurance if you are laid off from your job. Places like Canada, you pay taxes, you get healthcare. Heck, no, you, you get healthcare, period. We don't have that here. Also things like vacation, uh, they also included daycare centers, which has kind of gone away. If anybody knows anything about daycare, you know how expensive it is in the United States. Um, this was part of a benefit that would kind of go away. Um, some of you are actually doing daycare now and it's, a uh, it, it's very expensive, but that would be a benefit here. And so that's where union. So a lot of the things that we think about benefits, um, uh, I didn't put this in here, but I should have sick leave. Sick leave was another one. And I'm going to type that in because I do not want to forget that. This is a huge one. Sick leave. Unions fought for this and this would become a benefit that would come via employment. And it is only a way, it is a way of pay. Sick leave is pay. Healthcare is pay. Vacations, that's pay. When people think you're getting like healthcare, like this is some benevolent thing that companies give. No, it is pay. It is a way they can entice employers outside of wages. And it has a lot of effects down the road. We do not have guaranteed sick leave in the United States, unlike any other country, or guaranteed vacations. And we could also have maternal uh, sick leave also fits in with maternity leave and things like that, which the United States does not have. So one thing that happened though, as companies begin to produce goods for war, they had to cut back on consumer goods. And the same thing would happen in World War I, it would happen here and there would be shortages and if there's shortages that leads directly to inflation what that means is that there's going to be high demand for products like consumer goods like cars consumer or, you know for regular clothing for things like books housing you would not believe how expensive homes would become and there's virtually no construction there's gonna be a big construction boom in the 1950s and also for dresses. So here's the War Productions Board listing of how women, the, the length of their pants, the length of their fitted coats, length of daytime dresses, evening dresses, they had lengths for them. And you'll notice a little bit shorter to say fabric and the style would change. Remember we mentioned flappers from the 1920s? Flappers were, the, that, that style was a direct result of the French cutting back on women's clothing in World War I that would become the style in World War II. And also women, um, part of this would be because of, that would change for um, women would start wearing more pants, partially because it would, um, um, they could make pants for men and women and save fabric. And so this would be a big increases in prices it's actually pretty a fascinating thing how, how style would change because, because of that silk stockings, silk became impossible to get because of World War II. It came from China. Couldn't get it because of the War of Japan. And so nylon stockings, which is synthetic, made from petroleum, that would begin to become fashionable. Women would draw them in and nylons became less in fashion. And so to deal with the inflation, the Office of the Price Administration would be created and they would have strict wage and price controls. For some reason, I capitalized the P because I wanted to. But 
strict control of prices to make sure inflation did not get too bad, and also the rationing of goods. Therefore, people could not buy as many of uh, very high value products and that would keep the price down. And so these are rationing books. This is a book you would get. Um, rationing means that one person won't be able to buy everything. Because if one person could buy everything, somebody with wealth could buy everything that drives the prices up. So everybody can only buy a limited amount. So everybody would be able to get products that would become uh, necessary. You get a little stamp. This is for coffee. Coffee became almost like gold. Here is a stamp for your car and how much gas you could get for your car because they ration gasoline. Here's another one rationing oil. And so here's she's turning down her thermostat. And so that would pay for or to have more oil for the troops. Now, I should add the United States never had a shortage of oil during World War II. That was not the issue. The problem was a shortage of rubber. Rubber was very difficult to get from one of the biggest rubber producing areas, French Indochina. Hmm, Vietnam. That might be another story down the road. And so to limit the usage of rubber, they rationed gasoline. Therefore, you won't drive your car as much and there'll be more rubber because rubber was necessary for the troops, tires for war. And Mr. Black, became the name for the black market. And you would go see Mr. Black to buy goods outside of rationing. So store owners, organized crime would get goods, they would sell it under the table to avoid the rationing. And that's, if you ever heard the term Mr. Mr. Black, that is illegally selling to avoid the taxes. It's kind of like a bootlegging in the 1920s we've mentioned before. So I'm gonna see Mr. Black. And the United States did not have near as strict of rationing as let's say Britain or the Soviet Union, or for that matter, uh, access powers like Japan or Germany. But there was some depredations. And so one thing I love that, save your fat, because fats could be used for explosives. And so things like butter and, th and butter became like gold. And so, so weekly rations, the idea would be two ounce of butter, margarine, which is from oil-based. Uh, you get this big glob of, of, of vegetable fat and you would squirt <laughs> some yellow dye and kind of mix it all together. And that's, uh, so it looked like butter, but that's margarine. That's margarine. That'd be a World War II product. So limited tea, one egg a week, a little bit of milk. And here's a little bit of like uh, 12 ounces of sweet every four weeks. My dad can remember a story when he was a little kid and uh, during World War II, and he went to go buy chocolate ice cream <laughs> and they berated him. Don't you know it's a war going on? And he's just a little kid. And so was I at that time too. But, so this is a little bit of the way the rationing was. You know, it is depredation, but not huge. And you come up with some creative recipes to save meat because meat became very uh, hard to get. And so here, you know, <laughs> get up, it's spam and egg, yay! You know, spam, uh, but heck, if you didn't have protein, spam's pretty good because your body craves protein and fat. And that's one thing, heck, think what spam is. Three things your body craves, protein, fat, and salt. That's spam. And... So as I mentioned before, the Soviets got a lot of spam because of Lend-Lease and boy, do they still love spam. You see the same thing with all the spam that came into the Hawaiian Islands because of the war and, and spam is still a very popular food in the Hawaiian Islands. And people don't eat as much spam, but some people like it. But here's a couple of ways to save. Uh, when you have regular meat being very expensive in ration, here's braised heart with apples. Sweet and sour beef heart with noodles. Here, of course, is liver became bigger. French fried liver, liver pancakes. Mmm, chopped liver spread. Just put it on a little bit of toast. Delicious. Now, troops at the front had little sympathy for all the sacrifices they had to make back home. Here's a cartoon showing soldiers doing the real work, fighting an enemy that will that's with win or die. And it says, and we worry about tires, sugar, and taxes. And there's fighting the real front. I thought that was a good cartoon. 
but I should add this. It worked. In World War I, prices just for the wartime itself went up 170% from April 1917 to November 1918. <clears throat> and prices would nearly double again in 1919 after the war. During World War II, prices only went up 29%. So planting a victory garden or eating a rabbit or I don't even want to know what these fish molds are. But it worked. Now, the thing was, after the war, there's going to be all this pent-up demand to buy goods. And financing. Unlike World War I, the U.S. did a much better job paying for the war here. The progressive income tax rate went up to, the highest tax rate went up to 94%. In fact, FDR proposed a 100% tax on very large incomes over $3 million a year. That really only affected about seven people in 1944. But 94%. Now, remember I talked about marginal income taxes. The vast majority of people uh, weren't even close to the highest marginal tax rate. There were over 30 tax rates. And this is marginal. So it's only tax is taxed over a certain amount. But the debt did go up, the public debt because of the war, and then dropped dramatically. The debt was really low at the end of the Keynesian area. With the A, conservative economics, taxes, debt has gone up dramatically. Conservative economics, the big thing about that, remember, are tax cuts for rich people. But also borrow money. So here's one from the War Productions Board, taxes and bonds. Pay your taxes. By the way, if you ever, uh, anybody pay taxes now and they get a W-2 or they look at their receipt and it has federal income tax taken out, state income taxes taken out, uh, FICA, which is Social Security taken out. And so that's called withholding. So your employer withholds it from you, your paycheck and so you'll pay your taxes. And that's what you're doing when you uh, do your taxes. You're going to see, for most people, it's how much did I withhold from my, my employer withhold? So I withheld from my paycheck. Do I owe or do I, get, do I overpay a little bit? That withholding, that started in World War II. That was a World War II thing to make sure everybody paid their taxes. So war bonds would be a way to sell it. So I love the bonds. Buy bonds or bondage. Here is putting aside 10% for war bonds. Buy war bonds. There's Uncle Sam. And there's an example of war bond with FDR's face on it. And the whole idea was you get regular people, but also businesses, they would be pushed to buy bonds. Remember bonds, that is the way that the governments borrow money. So people buy bonds and then 10, 20, 30 years down the road, they'll get that money back plus interest. And so for example, you buy this $200 bond and actually what you would give is $100. And then in 20 years or 15 years, you would get $200 back. That would be the interest. That's how governments borrow money. And at the end of every movie, some, if you ever see World War II or a movie made in World War II, sometimes they include at the end to have buy bonds. They would advertise it in movies, propaganda all over. And this became one of the biggest measures of propaganda. Propaganda during the war was a little bit different than World War I. Remember, the U.S. was attacked. So this one, we have to encourage people to sacrifice buying bonds and everything else that comes with having less food or loved ones going away to fight. And the propaganda here did not need to rally us as much as hate. And these propaganda to buy bonds were intensely racist against Japanese. This was a horrifically racist war. And just one second, I have to move something. I'm gonna move my face back over here. And so here we have, I mean, look at the way they draw. Eh, just a sec. Sorry. They draw the Japanese face and um, keep this whore from your homes. Here, look how they draw the Japanese as the army, navy, and civilian stop them. That's in Alaska. Here has a swastika and the... Uh, Japanese flag, but look how they draw the Japanese. Your cigarette butts is an ashtray on this rat. And this from, this is a Boeing factory in Wichita, or Cessna, I'm sorry, Wichita, Kansas. And it says Jap hunting license. 
And you'll notice the way Uncle Sam draws us, and these are all to buy bonds. Intensely racist. Intensely racist. I could have more, and they're worse. But while we do this, one of the big changes in sacrifices was to replace all those young men. Remember, we have 16,000 mostly young men going to fight. And so women enter the workplace or the farms, and here is a woman in a munitions factory in Los Angeles, and pushing for the job he left behind. And eventually about double the number of women would join the workforce and a significant number were doing jobs that women were not expected to have, especially in the 1930s where there were so few jobs anyways because of the Great Depression. And so a significant number of women took jobs that men had and many of them were supervisory roles, etc. My grandma worked in a bomber factory in what is now, well, in Bellevue, Nebraska, now it's off at Air Force Base. And she went from making B-25s to B-24s to B-29 bombers. And since it's my grandma, I look at it as she made all the planes, but my grandma and grandpa worked in the factory. And my grandma eventually was a supervisor. And she had a supervisor position, a very important job of sending spare parts to repair damaged bombers or bombers that need um, damaged or broken bombers in the Pacific. And so women had these jobs. And I'll talk a little bit more about that when we get to the end of the war. And this is where we get the famous saying of, about women, Rosie the Riveter. Now the picture on the left is what most people see it. And this was actually done through the War Pro Productions Board in cooperation with Westinghouse. They made engines and that we can do it. But actually Rosie the Riveter comes from this um, Saturday evening post cover by the great or the famous American artist Norman Rockwell. And that was Rosie. If you look at it carefully, you look at her lunch pail, it says Rosie. And here she has all the symbols for V for victory or all the production symbols. And that's Rosie the Riveter with a riveting gun. Now, very few women actually riveted because riveting is a skill that takes a long time to train and women need to work right away. So a lot of that was switching from riveting to welding. But still, that's where Rosie the Riveter comes from. So we always look at the one on the left. It actually comes from the one on the right. And to be honest, as much as I like this one, the one uh, Norman Rockwell did is pretty cool. And uh, she's got some uh, guns. But big arms, doesn't she? <laughs> uh, I guess it's supposed to represent hard work. Oh, and one more thing I really like about this. She stand, she's sitting on a book, Mein Kampf. I love that picture. So... Some women join the army. Now, technically, they're this reserve forces, but WACs were the Women's Auxiliary Corps, and that's in the U.S. Army. So here's some women posing as WACs, but they would go to the front for supply or as nurses. Here are uh, flight nurses by a B-17 bomber in Europe. Some women would ferry planes over, pilots from all the way from all the way to the Soviet Union or across the Atlantic. Waves were for the U.S. Navy, Women's Auxiliary Volunteer Enlistment. And so women did join the armed forces, but were still seen as an auxiliary. And I got a question. I can't read what says. World War II Onda floating around today? Got to retype that. I'm not sure what you meant by Onda. Maybe I'm just misreading it. But just let me know in a sec when you get to that, and I'll, look, I'll answer the question. And as this is happening, there is going to be now a shortage of workers. A lot of workers, farm workers, in the 19, late 1930s were, uh, I mentioned this before we got to the Great Depression, but Okies, people who were kicked off of their farms and because of the sharecroppers being kicked off of or because of the... or because of the... Um, Dust Bowl. But now they're getting jobs in factories. And now there's a shortage of workers, agricultural workers. And that will lead to what's called the, Brick, the Bracero program. The Bracero program. And this would be set up to allow for either Mexicans or Mexican Americans. It was complex. Many, many uh, who start, started this program were. Oh, bonds floating around today. The bonds floating around today, people still have them, but they've all been paid off. So now they're just uh, 
a memento of what people have. I've seen them in antique shops, or sometimes I've seen them in you know, people selling like uh, antique shows. So yeah, they're still around, but they have been paid off. But rotating, you know, we continually have debt because you pay off debt, you have other debt adding up to it. And so these are Mexican workers, and this would be a temporary work program. And 150,000 Mexican immigrants would come in on these temporary programs. They're almost like indentured servants, but they would take jobs in now mostly farming and railway work. And here are applicants being applied. This is a similar thing happened a couple different times in the 1960s. Um, this program kind of continued. You'll see it again in the 1980s this was proposed. In 2007, this was proposed as immigration reform, almost something very similar. And it's not what you think. A lot of these workers would almost be tied to the land. And so this is still, this is treating them as second class citizens, but you're going to get a lot, there's going to be a lot of immigration from Mexico and other parts of, of Latin America into the United States. The term Hispanic was not really, was not used. In fact, you'll see a word called uh, um, Chicano used for a lot of the Mexican immigrants to the United States. And Chicano was used a lot up until the 1970s. On the AP exam a few years ago, there was an article, or there was one of the things about the changing America of the 1970s. And it used the word Chicano. And uh, I know a lot of students were very confused by that because I think I mentioned it once. Just, it just there's one of so many things out there. But that was a term for Mexican immigrants. And a lot of immigrants came, um, Mexican immigrants came or, or uh, into Los Angeles and other places for war work or uh, people of Mexican descent were already citizens and working in these war works, uh, war jobs. And this will lead to what's called the Zoot Suit Riots in 1943. And I should add, the Zoot Suit Riots happened in June of 1943, but this was actually nationwide race riots. There were riots against Mexican workers or Hispanic workers, not just in Los Angeles called the Zoot Suit Riots, but also in Texas. And there were riots against African-American workers who left the South and were going to places like Detroit or New York City. And so please get this down. I should have wrote this down. These were nationwide riots of white workers upset about either um, Mexican or African-American workers taking their jobs, dropping their wages, or expecting the same rights and brushing up against either existing Jim Crow laws or just existing racism that happened already. And so the zoot suit riots, these are zoot suits right here. These are long coats and that would be kind of cinched in the middle. And so they look at it as very broad shoulders. In fact, sometimes there would be shoulder pads on them. Broad shoulders that go down like this and then kind of expand out. So kind of here and then out. And so broad coats. And that was a style called the zoot suit. And a lot of young people wore those, but a lot of, of Mexican immigrants wore them too, to the, uh, were known for wearing this. And the Zoot Suit Riots would be mostly soldiers and sailors who, for various reasons, began to attack Mexican immigrants. And here, I didn't do a very good job um, with the picture here. I'm sorry about that. Let me move this. but they would attack 13 people would be beaten to death in Los Angeles. Almost all of all were immigrants, new immigrants to the United States. And this is where mostly white soldiers and sailors, which most of them were white soldiers and sailors attacking immigrants. And these were nationwide. So those are the zoot suit riots. Here's a picture of it in Los Angeles near, they used to have the best mass transit system in the world, Los Angeles, which seems hilarious now, called the Red Line. Here's one of the Red Line cars right there. This is also the time of the Great Migration, but there's also an intense, um, intense discrimination and racism. Don't forget that this began in World War I with, with African Americans coming up and taking jobs, it accelerated with people being kicked off of their farms, uh, sharecroppers, and then taking war work. And this United We Win, there's a lot of posters like this showing black and white workers working together. The idea is unified together. But look at the other one. That's why I bought Victory Bronze. And here is a porter, which was always almost always seen as a black man. 
and look at why he buys victory bonds so the white soldier can fight and get back to his 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 wife and this shows the the, the intense racism in fact it's mind-boggling how racist that poster is and the caricature they draw of the face here but they face discrimination there would be definite areas of, of large cities where in los angeles detroit new york where that were clearly discriminated against if blacks lived in even though they didn't have the jim crow laws discrimination and segregation existed a philip randolph of the porter's union one of the great americans of this era he even threatened a march on washington to do something about this discrimination and roosevelt terrified that a march on Washington demanding rights for African Americans, what that would do with its efforts to try to get into the war, as he looked at it one war at a time, of course that's easy for him to say, he convinced Randolph that he would do something about this and the first national organization to try to do something about discrimination in the workplace would happen called the Fair Employment Practices Committee. FEPC. And in it, it said by executive order of President Roosevelt that manufacturing jobs for war munitions, so taking government contracts, cannot discriminate based upon race. Did it work? Yeah. But this was the first effort. And so Roosevelt, who did was not aggressively pursuing civil did not aggressively pursue civil rights definitely followed the but wanted it remember he couldn't get civil rights even though he wanted it in the because there was no third new deal this would be an example of it but randolph pushed for this idea called the double v did not quite happen but the double v victory in civil rights and victory while having an integrated army and having blacks fight alongside whites Remember, this fits in with Frederick Douglass, what he wanted in the Civil War. Blacks, um, Af uh, blacks in the United States not, did not just want freedom for slaves in the end of slavery. They wanted to fight side by side with white soldiers to show they deserve equality in citizenship. But in 1943, as I mentioned before, there were race riots all over. And these were mostly whites attacking blacks. Now, these are mostly white workers attack black migrants who are coming up taking munition jobs in Ford or places like that. And the Detroit race riot, over 30 people would be killed. And this was an example how even or in the United States this was going on. And think about it. The United States is selling this fight as a war for war for uh let me hit it right there against ultimate racism here is a philip randolph talking in 1943 and there's a push to march on washington in 1941. so randolph by doing that he was still a big leader of the march on washington for jobs and freedom in 1963. most people think of martin luther king but he, he um yes he gave an important speech yes he was an important leader but it was men like randolph who really pushed this movement. But the army was still segregated. So this fight against ultimate racism in Nazi Germany, and they pushed that in the war. Yet black soldiers were mostly laborers. They were behind the lines. And uh, there would only be a few active combat units that were specifically trained and used in 43 and 44. Most famously, the Tuskegee Airmen. Here's a by bonds and using a Tuskegee Airman as an example. And these were fighter pilots who eventually would, would fly in P-47s and P-51 Mustangs and become one of the most successful combat squadrons in the Army Air Force. But here, most black soldiers here are laborers, and this is during the Battle of the Bulge in 1944, or working on the Alaska Highway or things like that. But by the winter of 44-45, there was such a shortage of troops that black units that were behind the lines struggling away would eventually come up to the front lines. And so here is a, this is a um, armored unit, armored reconnaissance unit, and that's going to Germany in 44. Here are members of, um, this is actually part of a parachute regiment, 
and some black segregated black units were allowed in. And there were some seg um, black non-commissioned officers and black officers, but they were still segregated in black units and white units. And most would still be laborers. And this was quite a shock when black soldiers were drafted into this army to fight against the evil Nazi regime and they're going to be segregated in units, segregated bathrooms, etc. But there's something else too. Remember this is total war and that concept of we cannot allow dissent, but what about somebody you don't trust as a nation? Remember how the United States did a little bit of this of war madness and we've already seen it, what happened in Nazi Germany at this time, this potential enemy within. And here is an incredible Dr. Seuss from early 42 showing Japanese Americans along the west coast of the United States as traitors to the United States. And here it has waiting for a signal from home, looking across the Pacific. They're all waiting for borders orders from Japan implying that all these Japanese Americans, and look how they draw the horrible caricatures of their face, are going to get TNT to become saboteurs to attack their country. Now, fifth column is another name for traitor. During the Spanish Civil War, Francisco Franco, the head of the Nationalists, the fascist leader, announced he has four columns marching on Madrid that was controlled by the, by the Republicans or Popular Front. Four columns marching in and a fifth column inside of Madrid ready to rise up, implying people who are already there would rise up. Thus, fifth columnists became a term for traitors. And look at that picture. I mean, it's shocking, but that is how racist it was. And we're coming to, of course, a Japanese internment. On February 19, 1942, there was an executive order issued by President Roosevelt as a wartime measure to intern Japanese along the West Coast. Eventually, 120,000 people would be forced out of their home, including losing everything they own, their factories, their, or their, uh, their businesses, their farms, everything, and being shipped to concentration camps. And here's a newspaper headline, the ouster of all Japanese. And by the way, by using the term Japs, Japs, that's why that it would become very much a racist epitaph to attack Japanese Americans. It was used so much in World War II with the same caricatures of Japanese as you see with Uncle Sam and I, or not Uncle Sam, well, with Dr. Seuss, or I showed you before. And there were economic interests. A lot of California farmers and small businessmen looked at successful businesses owned by Japanese and saw them as an economic threat. And so they encouraged this. They told, or they encouraged their elected officials who told Roosevelt that we can't trust Japanese Americans. So these are American citizens. 80,000 of them were born in the United States. These are American citizens. They're not Japanese citizens. And yet, because of nothing they did, but of who they are, they would be sent to concentration camps. So these triangles, these are assembly areas, and then taken by railway to camps. These are the biggies. Montana had an internment camp for Italian or German immigrants in Missoula. And there are also some POW camps around. Um, POWs would come to Mile City, my hometown, the story was, and they would pick sugar beets. But these are American citizens. So you can go to Heart Mountain. And this is a pretty, it's right in between the Bighorns and the Yellow, and Yellowstone National Park. This really dry, desolate area. Why? Because they buy the land really cheap. And so only here. And so here is closing their own... Um, the Ashai Dai works, so they're losing everything, and most of they would go bankrupt and lose it because they couldn't keep it going. Here, the Japanese owned store saying, I'm an American, but you know it's right above. They had to sell it. They had to sell out and rock bottom prices. And so this was partially economically driven. And so this was a way to drive out competitors, but also a political stunt by Western politicians. And here are Japanese Americans 
being this is the assembly line here on a train there's a very sad picture on the, the american flag each person can only carry a couple pieces of luggage and then something big for their family so a couple pieces of luggage and then some kind of bedding and clothing for the family here's the assembly of all their goods here lined up just coming off the trains two camps like this this is harp uh harp butte in the harp mountain in um wyoming and you'll notice these are the barracks they set up and this should make us all a little bit uncomfortable these camps should remind you of the camps i showed you a little bit earlier in other places like poland and these big barracks yes it was significantly better that's not the point the point is these were concentration camps set up by a country at total war remember what i told you about the logic of total war and why total war is so frightening this will justify imprisoning american citizens not because of anything they did but because of who they are and forced to live packed in these tight little enclosures for the entire war and economic issues were so important along the west coast this didn't happen there weren't any japanese americans interned any other places including the hawaiian islands still an american colony but there were over 200,000 japanese americans there and very few were ever interned they still had to could lead their normal lives and you would think of any place that would be a threat of japanese invasion and therefore a threat of saboteurs it'd be the hawaiian islands no it's the west coast and so here they are with you can see the barbed wire outside of the camp here's kids playing in wyoming this is in new mexico and look at that i mean that air and wind sweat that would be nightmare but you also notice an american soldier and that's in italy japanese americans were still drafted out of these camps into the united states army and most of them would fight in italy there'd be units but mostly segregated of, of japanese american soldiers and here he is in northern italy in the mountains there so the bench of this went to the supreme court because these are american citizens and this violated a number of amendments but the fourth but especially the fifth amendment and also no habeas corpus they're being imprisoned for no crime so the court case koromatsu versus the united states and here's that uh, koromatsu right there is a very young man <coughs> bring a case to the united states supreme court and the supreme court basically just punted they didn't want to deal with this question and so they upheld internment saying this is a military decision and we can't second guess the military remember president roosevelt made this executive order as a military necessity so basically they said nah and so here's the thing about total war the rights that people think they have could be thrown out if they could be thrown out for citizens of japanese descent they could be thrown out for anybody we right now in the united states you do not have we do not have as many rights as um under the fourth amendment the fifth amendment i could go on and i've talked about this before today as it did when i was your age i'm assuming your age is the people in my class watching this well the united states would eventually accept blame for the imprisonment of accept blame and but you'll notice it's in 1988 that congress would pass a law signed by president reagan and eventually every living Japanese American who was interned would get twenty thousand dollars, and that seems. Oh, I mean, don't get me wrong, not not twenty thousand dollars, but it's kind of a slap in the face. One more thing I have to add: this was off the era of the beginning of the Sun Belt, and the Sun Belt. That would be what we call this movement to the south, as Americans began going south to the Sun Belt, Phoenix, but to places that a lot of people did not live because of the hot, hot temperature and the lack of water, the combination of better technology for water, but eventually air conditioning. You have more people moving here in the 1960s and 70s. Most people think of this as a phenomenon then. You really see it, and or through today, how states in the North, like New York, New York State, was the most popular state in the Union at that time. No, not anymore. It soon will be the fourth most popular state. Why? movement here 
warmer temperatures. That started in World War II. And so with that, that is mobilization. And I did want to start just a little bit of counterattacks. I'm going to spend just a couple minutes on this because now the war is going to move fairly quickly. We've gone through all the events of mobilization, why it was fought, Hitler's mistakes, how the U.S. got into it. And now we have to finish the war. And by the way, those are American soldiers uh, walking through a street in Sicily. I mean, that's a really good picture. I really like that picture. I always wonder, what is he thinking right now? But there's the Axis powers in 42. And so Japan at their highest extent, but midway it just happened. And remember, the Germans had gotten to the gates of Moscow right here. So now we've set up the war and now we have to finish it. So today and tomorrow, we'll finish the war and do the atomic bomb. I could go on this indefinitely. It fascinates me, so many of these things, but I have to limit it. And so with that, this is going to begin the counterattack. First off, what of Germany? Hitler disgusted that they did not take Moscow. Hitler has taken overall command. Or as I put down there, command. Hitler takes overall command. I can't believe I put down command. I got to change that. Hey, I was typing. We'll act like that never happened. Did anyone see anything there? I didn't see anything. So, Hitler didn't trust his generals anymore. So he took off overall command because he knows everything and everybody else is an idiot. That's one of the things about social Darwinism and fascism. This idea that the leader knows all, well, eventually they believe it. They would have beat, beat the German or the Soviets at Moscow if they just would have listened to Hitler. Well, they did essentially follow him. And this would be a disastrous move for the German army. Hitler made terrible decisions time after time after time. He would get involved with the minutia of small units, as small as a squad of 10 men on the front and lose the whole big picture. He would demand his units to fight to the finish and not retreat to fight another day. And these horrible, disastrous decisions help win the war. But the problem is, if we go back to this map that I can't find, look how much area that was under direct German control. That's a lot of area to take back. And the German army was still very strong. In 1942, Germany, Hitler ordered an attack to the south. Now, let's backtrack just a little bit here. They got stopped right here. So they had to retreat to about here. They decided an offensive here to get the oil fields down here. So the oil fields right here. Huge oil fields still exist to this day. And to give you an idea how things have changed. So in 1941, Germany attacked all across the Soviet Union. Now here. And then eventually the last big offensive would just be a small area. And these are, this is still going to involve almost 3 million men and almost 10,000 tanks. But the German army still had not totally began to mobilize. They still didn't have proper equipment and they were desperately short of fuel. One more thing I should add. You notice this is about attacking the Soviet Union. It's like a funnel. Notice how it goes like that and that. It gets wider as you go. That means more area to take, making it more difficult to attack. So let's get now what his plan was to go get oil. And basically by getting the oil, he has accepted, this is basically going to be, basically be a war of this, uh, attrition. If they could get to the huge Volga River, sorry, why isn't this working? Oh, I'm hitting the wrong button. The Volga River right here. So take from the Don River to the Volga. Build a huge defensive line there. Take all the Soviet oil. Eventually, the Soviet Union will not be able to fight. They, they have to be running out of men. They have lost over 5 million soldiers since June 22nd of 1941. They Or 4 million soldiers. They can't fight that much longer. At least that's the way Germany is thinking. But Germany, they're out of, nearly out of men too. So if they could win this, here's the Soviet army beginning to rebuild. Stalin is also giving disastrous decision. And a massive attack along this front. It worked, but the Soviets were learning. They weren't allowing themselves to get thousands or hundreds of thousands surrounded like they did at Smolensk and Kiev. 
they were pulling back slowly. So the Germans had another massive advance. Sometimes it would be called the last blitzkrieg. And they did eventually get to the Caucasus Mountains. They did threaten some of the oil fields. They'll make dramatic shots of German mountain troops planting flags at 17,000 foot peaks. But they had to defend this flank. This flank right here. During the, Ru the Russian Civil War, Joseph Stalin would gain fame defeating the white Russians at a place called Tsarin right here. Of course, Tsarin then would be renamed Stalingrad. Today it is Volgograd. So Stalingrad. And so that was the largest city and industrial area, uh, an industrialized city in this part of Russia. And so you can imagine Hitler would have loved to take Stalin city and the Soviets, especially Stalin, it was a big matter of prestige to hold on to that city. So protect this flank, originally it was a minor part of this operation, but eventually Hitler ordered a massive commitment to take Stalingrad. So from the fall and winter of 42 into 43, the Battle of Stalingrad would take place. And what an amazing moment to quit. So I will finish this tomorrow. Are there any questions? I don't see any. Okay, so I will put up that, uh, uh, I'll get that reading out to you as soon as I can for the atomic bomb. It is fantastic. It's, it's, it's seen in a lot of pages, but it's actually really short. There's huge margins. I had to get it from somebody. And don't forget uh, the reading. We have a text. Um, and that review packet's coming up, but remember, only through 1896. All right. If there are no questions, I am done. Have a great day. Enjoy the sun.